um, versus uh, Steve Monaghan and uh, Robert D. Casqua, um, and also versus uh, the state of New Jersey. It's docket number MER L 1933 13. As we did the last time, we'll take the appearances of those in the courtroom first, and then we will uh, hear who's on the phone today. Um, so, on behalf of the plaintiff, Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. And uh, for the state of New Jersey? Good morning, Your Honor. Donna Kelly, Assistant Attorney General for Defendants, uh, Governor Christie, and Lieutenant Governor Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Slocum, Deputy Attorney General, also have the state defendants. Hey, I missed your last name. Slocum, Your Honor. S L O C U N. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, do we have a county official, a, a, a council for county officials on the telephone? Um, hello? Did you have a number for Yeah. Um, I pressed the button that you pressed for getting them off of you. You said they were on you. Thank you. 
God's reading those things. It would take at least two weeks just to print the 7,000 faces for the electronic machines, to slide it in and replace them, and to uh, reprogram the machines, which, by the way, are 1990s technology. They use tape. Uh, it's not an addition. We were purchased in 2004. It's 1990 computer technology. It's stuff that they, today, at 11 year old. I knew it was very quick because I was told I knew how long it would take, and it would take about two to three days tops to do all the machines in the state. I did not know at that time, since I had no reason to raise that issue or inquire for that issue other than informally for my own informational purposes, uh, that that was going to become an issue because I clearly understood it to be enough time. And in light of the fact that the Attorney General had filed a separate lawsuit, which is returnable for your honor tomorrow at 2 o'clock, where they said, we need two weeks, having 13 days, I think it would be enough. Based upon what I knew from Mr. Pell, because frankly, two to three days is really all you needed. So if they want, if they're saying the other case is 14 days, I thought the court could have granted the relief. At the very least, the court could have granted the relief with regard to only the machines and if possible, the sample ballots. And even that's not important, the sample ballots, because the statute which has been violated, and it's not a technical violation, it's not a suggestion, the legislature should not say, do what you can, is a statute that requires that the official ballots be configured this way. They use the specific word official ballots. An official ballot is, of course, by definition, not the same as a sample ballot. Sample and official are different words, different meanings, different places in the dictionary. So a sample ballot, while obviously preferably mirroring what is going to be on the machine, is not by law required to mirror what's on the machine. And, uh, more importantly, the statute specifically applies to the actual official ballots. So there is a middle ground that the court can apply here. I recognize, as I said last time, and if I didn't make it clear, I'll make it clear now, with regard to the overseas ballots, there's nothing that can be done. With regard to the printing of the uh, what we used to call them absentee ballots, but now they're book by mail ballots, whatever you want to call them, they change the back. <coughs> Same thing. I'm not asking that that be changed. You did initially, though. I did initially. I mean, we have a sort of a, a we have a, a, a rolling, well, a rolling series of requests. Because well, we, you also asked that the entire election be done by paper ballot. I asked on the 13th. I didn't get into court until the 3rd. So the, 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 the relief that's realistically available on September 13th is not the same relief that's realistically available on October 3rd. When I made that request, I didn't know uh, that it was going to be 21 days. They got a little over 15 days in the term date for them, so I had to wait three weeks. There's a reality that the court is overburdened as long. I'm not complaining about it, I'm putting it in context. No, my so, only position is that they were responding to what you asked for. I understand. And you asked for something different than what you than what your supplemental brief asked for. You changed your position on the yes. law, although I did not uh, yes. adhere to your supplemental position. And then, based upon the middle position, which I found was a, 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 an a, a accurate interpretation of the law, then we sort of wound up with what could be done. With what could be done. And so, the uh, frankly, I thought at the time, uh, back on October 3rd, I considered, I didn't say this out loud, but I considered requiring certifications to be filed addressing uh, the you know technology. But it didn't seem to me at, the, uh, at that time that there was enough time to have that process done, come back, and be reviewed. So I, I did consider that. I understand. It, it wasn't raised. And, but my point is, there, the state is using the issue that wasn't raised, and that was raised by your own reason. So it's not that after you said what can be done, to say, I should have known about this ahead of time, so you can't consider this new information under Rule 449 2. First of all, as a threshold legal matter, I would suggest that that's absolutely inaccurate, because this information is new. The court was unaware of it. I was unaware of it. Ms. Kelly was most assuredly aware of it. But to put in context, we don't have a transcript again, it was only last Thursday. I quite clearly, and if I didn't make it clear then, I will make it clear again now. At that point last Thursday, when Ron was talking about middle ground, I absolutely and unequivocally abandoned my request at that point about everything except the machines and the mail-in ballots. And quite frankly, I did the assembly ballots. And quite frankly, today, as a practical matter, even though I 
going on with today's printed technology, they can review those sample ballots. But the statute says they're supposed to be mailed eight days before the election, which is tomorrow. They all get mailed. Whatever said, they all get mailed tomorrow. Well, today is too. They get all. They all get mailed tomorrow. The point being, as a practical, fair, and equitable matter, uh, and in a set of circumstances where the law can get the respect which it is entailed, the statute should be enforced to the best ability that it can be under the circumstances. Uh, and under One of the, the things that I acknowledge about the, the certification that you just gave me, back in the brief that you filed on October 1st, you actually had a footnote, um, number five, at that time, October 1st, where you talked about issues, that, and that was about the rejection of the machines. You know, in the brief submitted to the New Jersey Supreme Court in June of 2013. So even as of October 1st, you had access to the uh, the certification from June that you were, I guess, I think it was public. It could have been access. That's the whole point about reconsideration. You need to come well, in. Well, in the I believe I was not talking about the Discordia case. I was, talk I was talking about the Discordia case, not this case. What, what documents are on the I'm referring to your brief of October uh, 1st, um, from the five. This very issue was discussed in length and detail by DAG Donna Kelly in a lengthy brief submitted to the New Jersey Supreme Court in June 2013, where the Attorney General was opposing a request by another party that the New Jersey Supreme Court hear a challenge to a lower court's decision rejecting a legal claim that the special general election must only be held on, on November 5th, 2013, simultaneous to the regular general election. Um, so I mean, you, you did mention it right there, and then you're giving me a certification of, on the, for the basis of reconsideration from that case, which, you know, on, on reconsideration, it's your, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to the first time around have given me uh, given the everything. Well, let me clarify. With regard to my reference to the Attorney General's brief, there was a 53-page brief that was filed with the New Jersey Supreme Court. That's what I found online. Not referenced or attached to that, uh, you will not find the certification or the appendix to that brief. That's in a separate area. But the brief itself, and, and that's why I gave the actual sites uh, when I emailed the paperwork, because when I found the brief, I didn't find Mr. Giles' certification. I only found the brief, and quite frankly, when you're filing a petition to the New Jersey Supreme Court, which is a court with appellate jurisdiction, it wasn't within my contemplation that there would be any new information that would be provided in that file, because the New Jersey Supreme Court was being asked to review what the trial court had done, the record from that, which was reviewed by the appellate division, affirmed by the appellate division, and then uh, Giuseppe Rillo had asked the Supreme Court to give a case. I was, under the, I was under no impression and had no understanding that new information was attempted to be brought before the New Jersey Supreme Court. But, so, but you see, it's whether the information is, uh, is available or not. I mean, I, it's, 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 it's just one of the points of reconsideration. Frankly, I, I just noted because you had mentioned it, you knew about the case, um, and you know, there it, it was in existence at the time you talked to the Sure. Case. Well, when I say I knew about the case, the rural certification isn't is published in the New Jersey reports or New Jersey Super. It was in an obscure document, not even linked to the brief online that I was able to find after when I went looking, because when I was looking and doing research for the main case, which Your Honor heard on Thursday, the issue of how long it would take was not an issue. But I did find when Donna Kelly was making the exact opposite arguments in a brief to the Supreme Court, so I pointed that out. That brief I could readily find. But the point I'm making is when you're talking about new information, first you have to have had the issue before the court in the first place. And by that I mean the first time the issue was raised. It's not like you had an opportunity to go out and research and your honest said take a break. Or like you said, you, you carry the member to ask everyone, well, how long will this take? From the bench, the first time you said to the parties, including me, how long will it take? I had my understanding. So why would I, in papers, submit information to the court on an issue that's not an issue. In fact, you just stop me from talking about things that aren't an issue because they're not relevant to the case. So why are they forward? Except in any election case, the practicality of, of reconfiguring the whole election process was clearly an issue for both sides. And you came and asked that everything be restarted, but you didn't give me specific information on how long it would take. So it clearly was an issue in my mind uh, that arose from your very filing. 
And the fact it wasn't addressed by you um, and was not specifically addressed by the defendants except in terms of their opposition to the, um, uh, the global relief that you sought, uh, they didn't parse it out and say, we can't do this in this time, we can't do that in that time. They just said, Moshari says, you don't, um, uh, once, the, once the draw is made, it's too late to do a redraw. That was their position. So they didn't parse it out, but they did tell me that they had sent out the mailing ballots. They told me that they had printed the sample ballots, uh, all of the number of ballots and so forth. So they did address the practicality of starting the whole uh, process over. And then in the course of the argument, I asked some specific questions, and Ms. Kelly gave responses, and we had some of the county clerks, I remember the actual, the Hunterton County clerk said that some of the sample ballots in Hunterton had already been sent to the post office, even though they had until, I think, tomorrow to, uh, to get out the sample ballots. Some of them had already been sent. But to directly address your own point, because this is a transcript, and it will bear out what I'm about to say, by the time we were talking about that finite time frame of two weeks, we were only talking about one issue, and that was the machines and the sample ballots. Because quite clearly, the uh, overseas voter law requires 45 days. And, and, and quite clearly, redoing everything, notwithstanding the asking for it initially, I clearly, on the record, abandoned everything at that point, except the two week, except the issue for the machines themselves and the sample ballots. There is no question that the record will bear that out. And as I stand here today, I'm abandoning, so that the record is clear, I'm abandoning everything except the request that the machines with the official ballots be corrected because I know that can be done. And how do I know that? Because of information I was previously unaware of, that the court was previously unaware of, tells us it takes not two weeks, but two days. And that certification was certainly known about by Ms. Kelly because Ms. Kelly drafted it and submitted it to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Your Honor may say, oh, well, we were talking about two weeks, we were talking about doing everything. No, we weren't. We were talking about the machines and the sample ballots. And now we know that it takes two days, 48 hours, from start to finish, according to Mr. Giles, to reprogram every machine in the state, which is exactly consistent with what I was told by Mr. Giles. Now, uh, what about the, did you receive the, the new certification from Mr. Giles? Yes. And so he addresses, um, you know, uh, gives additional information beyond what he, uh, uh, what was presented in the June certification. And um, he just, uh, okay. he, he mentions that there are, uh, he goes through the whole process. Uh, and I, I'm not sure this can be done in 48 hours. Uh, um, because of the, the, the legwork that's required to get you to the point where it would take 48 hours. Um, let me just, um, let me see, he talks about the various steps um, and um, uh, would have to be undertaken if they were required to replace the voting machine ballots. It's simply, it is not simply a matter of putting a new paper ballot face on the machine. Um, each individual voting machine would have to be reprogrammed. And, um, Which takes two days. I'm just um, looking here, talking about the, the, the cartridge created by the appropriate election office based on the ballots designed by the county clerk, set up by the printer on the gridded format. Each officer candidate is assigned a switch position on a graph. Um, talked about the ballot information being entered into a database. Um, any change of, in the ballot position for a candidate after the initial designation would require the county to redo the ballot programming for each machine. Uh, has to, once the ballot information is created, it must be downloaded onto the cartridge, which is uniquely identified by serial number and associated with a particular voting machine. Voting machine preparation also includes a setup diagram Sure, if it's if it's a uh, it, uh, test, I'm not sure if it's 
what set of diagnostics is, I guess I'll just from Ms. Kelly, but it has performed the ballot piece must be placed on the machine with protective mylar cover, the machine cartridge is inserted, a pre-logic and accuracy pre-lab test is performed, um, and uh, then there's things about uh, additional emergency ballot box. Middlesex has already started shipping its machines um, and has at, at, would at least have them done 25% by the end of the day yesterday. At this point in time, any redoing of the ballot would force the counties to redo the voting machines. It's my view the current election process uh, that it would be disruptive of the, uh, it is my view that any disruption of the current election process could well defeat the fundamental goal of the electoral process, the full participation of the electorate. Um, and, you know, he then addresses your allegation that, um, uh, that the uh, certification, the June certification, I think he's relying upon, is directly contradicted uh, um, by representations made uh, at the last argument. And um, he then he goes on to discuss what led to his filing of the June, um, you know, the June uh, thir uh, 2013 certification requiring the amount of time between the October 16th election and the November 5th election in terms of getting the machines ready. Um, and um, it talks about an important component for the success of the November 5th election being the fact that the ballot design and program was completed well in advance of the uh, election. Um, and let's see. Uh, and that in light of the legwork that they've done for the November 5th election, it would only uh, be necessary to burn the cartridges and reset the voting machines so they can be tested, certified, and delivered for the November 5th election. And uh, that they've already established expedited um, delivery uh, uh, schedule for the voting machines. And uh, let's see, okay. nine days is not enough time, um, and that was from yesterday. Um, not enough time to uh, do what the plaintiff requests to conduct the ballot, redraw, design the ballot, reprint and mail the ballots, reprogram and retest the voting machines with the new ballot and deliver the voting machines to the polling places to conduct an election of the 16th. So I just wanted to put that in the record so that it was my understanding of what he's saying now um, uh, to, uh, to, to look at uh, versus what he said in the, in, in the, uh, the certification on, uh, in June of 2013. May I hear it? Yeah, I First, just want to put it in the record and now you have to respond to what he said. First, I mark this as P1. I'd like to make this part of the record. This is the actual certification of this that I want to use the evidence and make part of the transcript. P1. You know, um, we don't take evidence here. Uh, you know, I, I think we've already submitted it, so it's already part of the record. I, I believe that you uh, attached it. Did you not? Why don't you just submit Yes, I did, but I want to make sure that this is attached to any transcript, but ultimately it's generated, so there's no doubt as to what the document was.
Um, was RA, the, is that the state's appendix? That you that was, that was at the state's appendix, but that's the starts of RA 34. Right. And goes right. So to this is your, this is your appendix. My doctor, correct. That's what I said. Okay. Yeah, no, I have, it's part of it. It's part of the record. It's part of your submission. Yeah, Your Honor, let me address this. Everything Your Honor said sounds good. It's all a lot of godly good white noise. Because what the state has done is try to enable them things I'm not asking for and say, oh, we can't do that in nine days. What Mr. Giles doesn't say is it will take more than two days to reprogram and do all the balance sheets. He says, in nine days, we can't reprint all the absentee balance, I mean, the, 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 the sample balance, but we can't do all that in nine days. I'm not asking for that. We're here. Mr. Giles works right up the street. He's a state official. We have three or four certifications from him. But Mr. Giles going to wrote the rebut we told the New Jersey Supreme Court. He told the New Jersey Supreme Court under oath, let me just, just read it, oh. with regard to time frame to reprogram the machines, which includes the face of that. Quote, some of the let's get the paragraph, okay? I want to make sure I have it so follow Paragraph 32? Paragraph 32, page 8 of the uh, Giles certification from June of 2013, which is uh, is part of the record in this case attached to the appendix. Uh, submitted by Mr. Lebron. Correct. Now, after we were told it would take 14 days, and to clarify, the transcript will say what it does. The 14-day time frame was to do the machines, not to do everything. It was the machines. That's what Ms. Kelly said. Mr. Giles, however, told the New Jersey Supreme Court by certification, quote, that's the time frame, supplemental staff members will be provided in sufficient numbers so that the voting machines throughout the state will be prepared for the November 5 election within 48 hours after the process begins, if necessary, regardless of whether the defeated candidate seeks to be checked. That would mean that voting machines will be ready for shipment on November 2 at the latest. That's the context of him. Mr. Giles said, what if I don't get the machines back till October 31st? He then goes on to continue to say, by using existing resources as well as extra resources that the state will provide if needed, the machines will be deployed and received by the respective polling places in sufficient time for the November 5th election. Paragraph 33 starts, additional transportation resources will also be made available by the state, if necessary, to deliver the voting machines to the polling places within 48 hours. So what Mr. Giles said under oath in the New Jersey Supreme Court isn't changed by the certification of your honor is placed on the record, because the time frame of nine days he's talking about to try and prevent what I want happening isn't limited to what I'm asking for. He includes within that nine days the printing of the sample ballots and all sorts of other things. But it sounded as if, at least my, my, uh, I'm not versed in the technology of the voting machines. Uh, unlike right. uh, Judge Feinberg, I didn't uh, sit uh, to, to hear all that testimony. But the sense I got from the most recent certification that he filed is that there's a lot of legwork that needs to happen. And all of that would be done in advance for the November election. Um, in, in terms of uh, prepping the ballot faces and the things that I already read into the record so that they could do it in 48 hours. And, yes. I, and I don't know that the, he didn't, it wasn't addressing that in the June 2013 uh, You're right. These, these machines purchased in 2004 based upon 1990 technology have been rejected and stopped being used in those states such that you can buy these on eBay. And it takes to print, as long as it takes to print 7,000 sheets of paper, which you can't go to states about two hours. That's printing the sheets of the ballot. They want to make it look like this is some kind of special paper, like it's anointed with the aroma of unicorn methane or something like that. It's a print job that any printer could do. Can't go, I know 10 printers could have done in a couple hours. Then they take that and they pull back the plastic, they pull out what's there, and they put it what's there. And then all they gotta do is reprogram the machine. You know how long that takes? According to Mr. Giles, two days. That's what he told the Supreme Court on June 18th. And he didn't work but that in this most recent certification. And you want to know why? Because he can't, because it takes two days. Now, the delay of success last Thursday may, might have made their job more difficult by cutting out the extra time that they would have had. That is a different issue. Because it's not an issue of convenience, it's an issue of whether or not it can be done. Because if it can be done, it 
it should be done. The law says it's supposed to be done. They don't get to ignore the law. It is not a technical violation. They come back with this anemic response, which you're right around America. Oh, we'll take all, yeah, take all this time to do all these things I'm not asking to have done. I'm asking to have the basis printed. I'm asking to have the ballots reconfigured. That is my application. And so the record is clear. Let me say it again. That's all I'm asking for. Because 19 colon 5 dash 1 mandatorily requires, when read in character with 19 colon 14 dash 12, that the Republicans and Mr. Lonnie not have a separate political party column. Okay. These are very significant. And with regard to the information, it is ironic because, again, it's kind of disingenuous for me to say, you know, Mr. Giles, and I'm coming in here saying, uh, saying that you should consider what I have for Mr. Giles. But the difference is what I have for Mr. Giles addresses the issue directly. The information that they want to provide, which they clearly could have provided and chose not to, which the court read into the record, uh, talks about issues extraneous that weren't raised, but doesn't rebut what I'm saying. According to the information I have from the greatest expert in the country, again, I know that I'm remanded, you're in charge of the Escorty case. And I also know that you haven't provided it to me on this application, so I don't have it. All I have are the two Giles certifications. I don't have any certification from any expert to support what you're saying. Really? Giles? I mean, other than Giles, and you're, you're, telling, you're throwing names around that are not part of the record here, and conversations you have with individuals. I don't have that as part of the, of the record here. It's not competent evidence before me. I feel that it's backward information as to why I continue to look when I was told it was 14 days, because I knew that was not accurate. And not only did I, when I continue to look, did I find something, I found something from the guy who's in charge in the right of order of relief to do this, say it takes 48 hours. And the certification he submitted does not rebut that. Okay, so I'm going to hear from this guy. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I, I do appreciate, Your Honor, that you do not have the, the Christy D. Grillo brief in front of you. It is on, as Mr. Uh, the plaintiff here has indicated, he apparently got it off of, off of the website. What I find really interesting is if you do look at the, the state's brief that was filed in the state's brief recording, Christy D. Grillo and Christy, it does reference the, the job certification and talks about it extensively within the body of the brief from pages 39 to 44. So that further bolsters the state's position that this is not an appropriate motion for reconsideration because the plaintiff had this information that he could have brought forth in his initial application. Well, he, he said he, just, he didn't have it, but the test is, was it available? And so, yes. I mean, he, you know, I accept Mr. Laverne's representation. Oh. He didn't have it, but it's, that's, we don't take a subjective view of, you know, uh, for, for reconsideration, whether you had or didn't have something. But he also makes the point, though, that the, 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 the way the litigation has evolved, it wasn't so clear uh, at the October 3rd hearing that we'd be focusing on what the machines could do. So I don't know, if, in light of that, uh, perhaps I need to look at this on the merits rather than just say he doesn't meet the typical standard because in the interest of justice, one can always relax. So no, I, I, I really do appreciate that, and that was my second point, Your Honor. Even if you did have before you last week the, the um, certification was filed by Mr. Johnson in the Grillo case, it should not have made any difference in terms of the, the correct outcome, in terms of not the worry any of the for the October 16th election because the certification of spinal in the state Supreme Court in June is not contradictory to what the state has maintained in, in this case. The focus, the focus, the focus for the Grillo v. Christie certification was the voting machine issue. That, in that part of the process that we focused on, was really what I would call, and I have called, the back end of the process for, for election preparations. The front end is really still what um, the plaintiff here is seeking, and it's a, a, a draw for ballot position, it's a reprinting, and it's a reprogramming of the ballots for purposes of preparing the voting machine. And that's clear in the certification from Mr. Um, from Mr. Giles that in order to program the ballot for the machine, it all had to be done at the time that the um, you were doing the programming for all the ballots. So that's all done internally with, with the computer, as he indicated in, in his current certification. Well, but what about, you know, what Mr. Laverne 
points to the, the, the section of the June 2013 um, uh, certification of, of Mr. Giles, where he does speak about being able to um, just, uh, train the certification is not complex. This is for the people working with the voting machines. It's a way of the voting machines are straightforward to design. There are instructions provided for their preparation. Uh, supplemental staff members will be provided in sufficient numbers so that the voting machines throughout the state will be prepared for the November 5th election within 48 hours after the process begins. So, I mean, it's not un un you know, unreasonable for Mr. Laverne to take the 48 hours, even if it's at the back end. Uh, I mean, that's not the back end. They're talking about the front end, that we concluded the October 16th election, and then he says, we can can get the November 5th election, get those machines ready within 48 well, hours. Isn't that the front end? No, no, no. But I, again, I'll try to explain it, Your Honor, is that the way we look at, we look at the election preparations starting with putting aside the nomination petition and the whole petition final process when you get your candidates. Now you come to where you're going to do the ballot draw for ballot position. From there, you're going to be doing ballot printing. From there, you're going to be doing the programming. Of the of the ballots that will be printed for the mail-in ballot sample and the voting machine that's all done. What that to us, Monica, is the front end of the pre-election preparations, and then from there you're going to the voting machines. Now the difference here is that considering what the plaintiff still wants, he's asking the county clerks to do a redraw for the ballot position, which would require a reprogramming internally before you can even get to the point of, you know, burning the cartridges and preparing the voting machines. For the November 5th election, we've already done the ballot work. August 12th was the ballot draw. All, September 16th was the, the day that the, the clerks had to put the ballots to the printer for the printing. So that's all done. So what we're saying is, if we do not, if there's a, if worst case scenario is if there's no recheck prior to the November 5th election, all that work will have already been done. We don't need to go back and redo that, which is what they're asking, this plaintiff is asking you to do now. And, in, and the other difference here is that there has been, as indicated by Mr. Johnson's certification of yesterday, there's been a lot of advanced planning by the counties, knowing that we had a three week time period between the two general elections. So there's been additional planning, as he indicated, with dealing with municipal clerks and polling place, getting access to polling places, having your staff, additional staff ready to to deal to deal with this uh, three week time gap. So that's why that's why this to, to us, your honor, this situation is not comparable to the November 5th situation. It's comparing apples to oranges because we're not having to face for November 5th this whole stepping back and now doing a redraw, reprinting, and a reprogram. Well, that's the sense I got from looking at the two certifications, but Mr. Laverne makes another point that um, that Mr. Giles didn't segregate the, uh, the, uh, the time it would take to reprogram the machine. Um, and uh, he lumped some things together and said it couldn't be done in 90 days. But, um, the, other, the other point, too, Your Honor, he does have the certification that with Middlesex County, you already have machines on the road. You're already in polling places. He says that in his own, um, we'll stick with what he said in the certification for his one county, they anticipated having at least 25% in the polling places as of, as of today. As what, of yesterday, actually, the end of yesterday. What about his point of that, you know, that, that if, if we had a valid access issue with a death, for example, in less than 10 days, I mean, I guess. Perhaps if it could be done, I mean, if, you know, if it had to be done, it could be done. Uh, and, and I'm not, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't know what statute he's really referring to, but I think there was one statute on 19 colon, the whole point about something did happen, it's an old statute. I'm not aware of us being able to change, making ballot changes 10 days before an election. I'm not aware of that unless it's under court. I know the other thing that was of great concern to me at the, at the October 3rd hearing were, were inconsistencies between the sample ballot and the machine ballot. I know, I think at least the, maybe in the Judge Haynes' decision, he had allowed 
of it, but I was very concerned at the, 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 the potential for voter confusion. And I was really struck that Huntington County, for example, had already sent a certain number of field ballots, sample ballots, to the, uh, you know, to the post office. And so I was concerned with, even if, I don't think I made a finding. You know, I, I haven't gone back to listen to what I said, but we have a, a clerk's notes, and I asked my law clerk to listen. And I don't think I ever said it physically couldn't be done. Um, I, uh, I may even have assumed that it could be done if it had to be done. But I was looking at the balancing of the hardship and the impact on the voting public of particular um, uh, inconsistencies, certainly between the sample ballot and the official ballot. And, and that, that, is, that, that concern is even greater now, Your Honors, we're eight days away from the election. And in, in Mr. Johnson's application, he does, he does state that what the clerks provided to the court last week shows that 3,941,130 sample ballots have already been, were already sent out as of October 7th. So that, and now if what they're looking for is to have that redone. Um, and in terms of the sample ballot also matching the, quote, the official ballot, that is what the law does see. It's 1914-22. And, and again, I think it's what you heard from at least one of the county council last week, the whole concern that voters who didn't read their sample ballot look for a certain like position of their of their chosen candidate on the ballot so that when they go to the machine, it'll be what they read before they, you know, before they got into, into the voting booth. And you know, if if um if, for example, the relief sought would violate one aspect of the um, of the elections law, which is that the sample ballot should match the official ballot, um, so the relief sought would violate that, but not giving relief would violate another provision. Um, I had to balance. I had to balance. And do you want to? What is your view in terms of the, the the factors in terms of balancing the harm to the electoral process? And not the factors, but the you know how how would you balance the uh, the, the the concern you know the concerns that we have um, here? I think that the, right now, as we stand before this court, the concern is our focus should, should solely be on the voters. Uh, the voters next week, uh, on October 16th, next Wednesday, they you know expect to um, be going into their polling places, knowing that the machines are, are done and set, and that the machine face will reflect what the sample ballot has indicated. Um, this is not a case where we have somebody who should have been on the ballot and somehow we forgot who's name. He is on the ballot. And as also your, your honor realized, I think, when you look at uh, one of the sample ballots last week, it's clear. It's a simple, short ballot. It, the names are right there, the eight names. I mean, it's not as if there's any, um, will be any voter confusion in, in that regard. I think there'll be greater voter confusion, potentially, if the sample ballots don't reflect um, what the machine says. And also, if the court were to even think of considering the relief that he's looking for now, I, 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 I really, eight days away from the election, with the machines already being in the polling places, I, I just really don't know how you can effectuate that because, again, it's not simply reprinting a piece of paper and putting it on a machine because the name of the candidate is connected to a grid position that's in the machine because it's all like the votes are all electronically recorded. And that is what Mr. S uh, Giles indicates in his certification. And that's how, that's how you program voting machines. This is not you know, a paper ballot system where we're just reading, like a, a manually reading somebody's like check off on, 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 a, on, a, on a ballot. I mean, these, these, the name has to be coordinated with a position in the machine electronically so that when the votes, votes come out, they are as the voters intended. So um, again, this is not a simple going to Kinko's process, Your Honor. And the um, other thing that, I mean, I don't know if this may be more an issue for tomorrow, but I know that, for example, one of the, at one point, Mr. Laverne had asked that all the, uh, and maybe he's asked it for in, in, in response to the application of the state about the rechecking of the machines that's been ordered tomorrow, but he had asked at one point in, uh, for a complete paper ballot process. And we recently had a decision from the appellate division that remanded a piece of the, the challenge to the voting machine case to me uh, because there had been a problem in Cumberland County. I think we discussed this briefly at the 
uh, at the last argument. And so I know that um, Mr. Laverne was very concerned about the integrity of the voting machines. He's underscored that today. But frankly, that was also in my mind um, when I was balancing um, the, uh, the uh, effort to get the placement right under the statute versus the integrity of the election. And when I will be doing a remand on the voting machines, I was concerned that rushing reprogramming uh, was not a good idea, uh, um, particularly at this point in time before I've had the remand and can see what actions the state has taken to assure problems that uh, those that are most common will happen. And it was responding to a concern he raised about the integrity of the machines that was also in my mind in terms of, uh, even if it could be done, uh, uh, even if the reprogram could be done uh, from October 3rd to October 16th, or even from today, October 8th, it seemed to me as if it was better not to interfere with the reprogramming process in a rushed way as was being, as was being requested. Yes, Your Honor, I think it would be even more rushed today as we're standing there. And again, comparing the time frame between October 16th and November 5th, the state, the counties have already taken the, the advanced planning to add additional resources and staff to make sure that everything can be done properly, because that is our number one priority. Whereas we're not in that position at this point, especially since, again, machines you know, are, are on the road. The other thing that strikes me is that um, what's being sought here is, uh, uh, is to uh, effectuate the ballot placement requirements of the, of the state election law. But I don't have a record uh, with any facts as to the impact of placement on the ballot and, and what the impact it could or would have on the election process. I have I've looked at the earlier decisions and the cases that Mr. Laverne himself was involved in, either as a party or as an attorney, um, and there's, there have been allegations made in some of those cases, even going back as late as 1999, I believe, in the Moshari case. But I don't have any facts here to demonstrate what, the, what practical harm there might be from the ballot uh, placement. Do you, do you want to, you know, it's the position of a candidate placement on the ballot. I, I, I agree, Your Honor. I, we certainly don't have any indication. And, and again, the, um, if I were a voter and if I, you know, looked at a ballot and if the font of one candidate was smaller than the other or was larger, somehow it was unbalanced, it seemed unfair, or if you had all the candidates in one position and then somebody was separately out of a different line, then I could, then I could, I could see a concern with the ballot placement. But that's certainly not the situation here. As Your Honor has in the record a copy of one of those in the sample ballots. So, there hasn't been any real harm presented um, in any consideration for this court regarding this, this, this application. I know that uh, you know, Mr. Laverne had raised the point the, the last time, and, and, that, and it sort of underscores what he has said today, is that it's very frustrating when there is a violation of, of the statute. And the, you know, for a court to find a violation and no remedy is also goes, goes against the grain. But, you know, you pointed out that if I grant this relief, we'll have a different kind of violation. And so, is there any recourse? I mean, if, if, if there's nothing before the election, is there anything after the election in terms of, you know, an investigation by the superintendent of elections? Well, I mean, or? He, he, certainly a, a party has the right to ask to contest an election. If you look at Chapter 29 of the statute, um, there are enumerated grounds upon which somebody could contest an election. I'm not sure I've ever seen one where it dealt with ballot placement, but nevertheless. Um, and as for any um, investigation by county superintendent elections, um, somebody who should properly have to come forth with a substantiated uh, complaint um, that would lead uh, consideration to an investigation. So it, it's not something that is done um, lightly, and it's not done with just, you know, with just a comment or an anonymous letter, it's something that somebody would have to really put in writing, give a, a, a reasonable basis for, for, for a look at the question. Yes, Your Honor. Um, but the other point, too, about your 
you know, the concern with finding violation of the age credit remedy. Again, we'll go back to what we have said earlier in our papers is that um, Mr. Laverne was, was clearly, by his own statements, was aware when the ballot was taking place. Uh, and yet he waits three weeks, um, you know, after that, after the ballot row was done by the county clerks, uh, he has indicated he has some familiarity with the election process, so nothing was barring him from seeking uh, relief at an earlier point in time, and, and that could have made all the difference. It could have. I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I think he, he said he did not know uh, the, the date of the draw because he could not find the, uh, the timeline. Uh, you made the representation to me that the timeline uh, was, was available uh, as of July, I don't know if it's July 13th. It's July 13th. But no, what I was referring to was the letter that he apparently sent to the county clerks, to all the county clerks before the ballot draw was done. Right. Telling them that, you know, you, this is my advice, you should listen to it. Um, and, you know, he certainly could have, he claims he made an inquiry with one county clerk and both two county clerks. There's nothing in the record to show that it's true. But again, it, 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 it's, uh, we, we believe there's indication that he was aware of the process, would have this particular issue in, on, on his mind around that time, and there's nothing that's proposing him from coming into it sooner. But we are moving on right now. We had to address that the last time. Okay, that's fine. And I think there, there's some little bit of differences that that's um, your understanding of what he said and well, my understanding. And he was, he also mentioned that the, the delay was necessitated by a uh, uh, right to know request because he didn't, that Berlin didn't even release the sample ballots to him when he requested it. Things that's like that. Right. Sure. But, but the point being right now, Your Honor, is that we believe there's absolutely no basis for the court to uh, grant this motion for consideration. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bilal, um, I know that, uh, are you still there? Yeah. Um, Mr. Giles' uh, certification made specific reference to Middlesex County. I know that you didn't file any papers, but this was, uh, I put this down for uh, review today. Uh, and uh, is there anything you wanted to, uh, to uh, place on the record on behalf of Middlesex County? Uh, no, Judge. Um, the, um, the statements that Mr. Giles said are consistent with uh, the county's position. And my understanding is that Mr. Giles called our um, Board of Elections Administrator, James Oldbrook, um, yesterday morning, spoke to him, they discussed the, uh, the, uh, the details uh, involved in dealing with the, with the ballot machines, or the uh, voting machines, rather, and um, Mr. Giles used that information as part of the certification. And uh, Mr. Vogel has reviewed that information and said that it is an accurate reflection of their conversation. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll hear from uh, uh, Mr. Lieber. Thank you, I'm sorry. I'm just not drinking the cooling, and I hope the court doesn't need uh, All this stuff about the voters and all this stuff, they're so great. The voters expect the machines are going to be done. Let me tell you something. I worked the uh, Board of Elections since I was 18. I've done election recounts, election contests. I know what the voters expect. You know what the voters expect? That there's going to be a machine there at 7 o'clock on the table the polls open. All the stuff that happens behind the curtains, they neither know about it nor care about it. That is the reality. So the question is, is whether the voters are worried about the machines might have to be brought back in 25% of Middlesex County, and we already know that 100% of New Jersey can be done in two days. So I suspect that could probably be done in a minute. It is. Uh, the question is whether or not I'm asking for can be done. Because the court's not saying it shouldn't be done. And the court is not saying that I'm not entitled to it because the law's in my favor. The court simply said they violated the law. Can we do something about it? Now, Ms. Kelly did almost a disturbing point because you're honest, well, what else have we done post-election? You know, because they want to say, this is all my fault. The county clerks do a drawing 45 days before an election at 10 o'clock in the morning when the only statute that authorizes the drawing says 85 days at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they don't tell anyone about it until after it's over. And suspecting that there's going to be a drawing but not knowing when it's going to be because I've been down this road before, you know, like I used the example last time, it's like the guy in the seaside town that builds a five-story house in the zoning area where you're only allowed to have two things out. Once it's built, there's nothing they can do about it. Yet, they made a guy take one down when he did that. Why? Because it could be done. Okay? In this case, what do we have here? 
We have the wholesale violation of state collection laws by 21 of the county clerks that has resulted in an illegal ballot configuration. It's not a definitive violation. It is a clear violation of the statutory law. And if a remedy can be provided, it should be. And all this stuff about the voters being worried, let's go to what is before the board, OK? If your honor is willing to consider the Giles certification of June 18th, what is before the court is to use the phrase back end, front end. It takes 48 hours to do what I'm asking. That's what it takes. And it takes another 48 hours to deliver the machines. Now, conceitedly, is it okay to violate one statute at the expense of another? How do you make that judgment call? What's more important at the end of the day? is the official ballot. Because it's interesting. Everyone wants to convert my argument into something that it's not. I'm not bringing this case as a ballot location case saying it's unconstitutional, the local so we the left, we don't find this problem. I'm bringing this case and hey, the law says this, not me, the legislature. And they've said it since 1930. These 21 county clerks have known it since they took office because I've sued them before, including last year. So they can't say they didn't know about the applicability of 1905-1. And I parenthetically know only three even have the audacity to argue that it doesn't apply to special elections, because it quite clearly does. And Your Honor found very quickly that it quite clearly does. And against this background, these very same county clerks all get a letter from me. And it's not just one. We have the certifications. Only one clerk, I believe it was Cumberland County, did us all. We never got anything from this over. And with all due respect to Cumberland County, they keep the records a little different down there. Everything in Essex and places like that is stamped and time dated. They're not going to try to tamper with that. I don't know if those are covered. All I can tell you is they got it. They got a letter. Everyone got a letter. And they don't know about this because they all talk about it. They all have the same counsel, John Corbo. They know about this issue. They chose to ignore it. I didn't know that there was going to be a joint. Because once again, the joint they held was supposed to be 85 days before the election at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, only they knew they were going to be drawn. I didn't know they were all going to draw. But if, if you didn't get anything, see, get anything 85 days before, you could have, you could have objected at that point, which would have been before they did the draw, and say you had, you violated the statute already, but you didn't do that. I mean, so you know, it's. Uh, I said you can't do that. Judge, what I'm saying is they just knew about 1951, ignored it because they knew about the prior cases, and they knew about it from my life. And their attitude is, so us. And by the time they arrive soon, then their attitude is, yeah, it's too late. And, and then, and there it goes, and there it goes again. At some point, you know, because this comes along, there's their an investigation post, well, someone will have to write a letter or someone, write a letter. Last time I checked, a finding by the assigned judge of Mercer County that 21 county clerks violated the election laws and didn't do what they were supposed to do, should be enough, in and of itself, to invoke some form of investigation. I assure you, it is informed outside of the Attorney General's office, but we're talking about what can be done between now and Election Day. This is an election for the United States Senate. Yes, I can bring an election contest, I can bring an election challenge, I can bring an election challenge to the United States Senate, based merely upon their wholesale failure to comply with the law. And quite frankly, I'm not sure what's going to happen, because we don't know what's going to happen on the 16th. That's still quite a, you know, a, a week in politics is a lifetime. Depending upon what happens with certain things the FCC are doing, this could be a very, very different race, or it could be exactly what everyone expects. I don't know. But what I do know is the rules of the game are defined. The They're cheating. I call them on it. Their explanation is, it's too late. You should have come sooner. This, that. Why am I supposed to expect that they're going to violate the law? The presumption is that they follow the law. And the presumption is that this court will then impose what the law requires unless there's no way to do so. Now, the question is, they're putting the wrong word. Because once the court has found a violation, they should have to come forward with evidence to show that it can't be remedied. The burden should shift at that point. I shouldn't have to come forward with evidence to show that it can be done because they're in a position to do it. How is I mean, I do know because I, 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 and again, you want to know more about this, I'm here again. I've had the pleasure of spending a very long time with Mr. Cobb. I know way more time than Mr. 
Islamic world machine is the right need to, and I assure you, as we stand here today, I know a lot more than you. You'll know a lot more than you when you start to reinvent here. But this is no big deal. They've been holding elections in this country before a revolution war. We've been holding elections in this country for well over 200 years. There have been problems, there have been election contests. The first election in New Jersey, which took place over two days, not Excuse one Excuse me, day. I don't need to hear this, Mr. Lindbergh. Do you have anything else that, um, uh, I think, I, I think that partly I've heard, uh, heard your arguments uh, both uh, now and Yes. And in the pre that that you're talking about, the pre-check that everyone's so concerned about, I'm not concerned about because now I know what that really means. That's included within the 48-hour time frame. The fact of the matter is, based upon your honor's findings and conclusion of law, the 21 county folks violated the state election laws, didn't do what they were supposed to do. Now they want to point a finger on me because it's too late to do it. They should be forced to come forward on a verdict that they say that it can't be done. Because number one, I suggest that it can be done. So they should have to rebut that. I've come forward with a certification from Mr. Giles saying it takes 48 hours. They want to say that it's all sorts of things that are outside the time of that, and it's really not. As business I was saying last Thursday, we're going to be here tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And it's going to be interesting to see tomorrow what we're going to say as to what the time frame between this, uh, the October 16th election and the November 5th election, what really takes. Because I already know the dates. I read the papers. It's exactly what I've said. It's exactly what Mr. Giles okay. I don't think I need to hear anything else, Mr. Lindbergh. Thank you. You may just see it. Um, this is the court's decision on the application by the plaintiff, uh, Mr. Laverne, for reconsideration of the court's um, uh, order from October 3rd denying relief uh, in the election case uh, that, uh, uh, that he brought uh, regarding the uh, placement of candidates on the ballot for Senate uh, for the elect special election scheduled for October 16th, uh, 2013. Um, the, um, the basis of the motion for reconsideration was citing new evidence. Um, and the, uh, the new evidence uh, consisted of a certification from Robert Giles uh, that was supported uh, by, I'm sorry, that was uh, provided in support of the state's position uh, back uh, in, in June of 2013. Uh, when there was a challenge made to the uh, governor's decision to hold a special general election for the United States Senate on Wednesday, October 16th, 2013, in order to fill the vacancy left by the death of uh, former United States Senator Frank Lautenberg. And uh, that case was Giuseppe uh, Grillo versus Governor uh, Chris Christie. And the, uh, uh, our the Assistant Attorney General, Donna Kelly, has submitted a brief and appendix uh, uh, in that matter. And there was a certification of Robert Giles, Director of the New Jersey Division of Elections. And in that matter, there was concern that having an election on October 16th, so close uh, to the general election of November 5th, uh, would be uh, 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 prohibitive in terms of uh, complying with all the election laws. Now, as Ms. Kelly pointed out, that I don't have the 53-page brief. I didn't make an effort to, uh, to read it uh, uh, prior to today. Um, but I did review the, the uh, certification that Mr. Laverne provided um, that took, was uh, where Mr. Giles discussed the recheck procedures for machines after an election. Um, but the, the concern was that there, at least as I understand, one of the concerns raised in the criminal litigation is that could you uh, complete the recheck procedures after the October 16th election in order to prepare the machines for the November 5th election. And Mr. Giles addressed that, and, and it was a admittedly tight time frame, uh, three weeks between the two elections. Um, but Mr. Giles assured the Supreme Court that the, uh, the time for all the processes that he talked about, which included the programming of the, uh, of the machines, um, that um, they're going to do additional training of staff, that the, uh, the voting machines are straightforward design, there are instructions provided for their preparation, they're going to provide uh, extra staff so that the voting machines will be prepared for November 5th within 48 hours after the process begins. And um, so that voting machine should be ready for shipment on November 2nd at the latest, and they're going to make available 
available uh, additional transportation resources uh, and uh, staff. So that reading the Giles certification, it, it's clear that voting machines can be prepared and delivered within a four-day period, two for the programming, two for the transportation of all the uh, all of the machines to the different uh, voting sites. And I accept Mr. Laverne's representation that he discovered the certification after the oral argument on October 3rd and seeks reconsideration of the court's decision that no remedy would be ordered uh, for the statutory violation that, uh, that he had uh, uh, shown uh, had existed here in terms of the drawing of the uh, ballot positions. Uh, and the court did find on, uh, on October the 3rd that there, in fact, was a violation of the um, it's 5.1 of the uh, election law when um, Steve Monaghan was given a party place, uh, on the Republican party place on the ballot rather than being put in with the uh, candidates who were nominated um, by petition. Um, so uh, the, the, the focus today is really on the, um, uh, on the remedy. Uh, and as I mentioned in the colloquy with Mr. Laverne, the remedy that he requested morphed at, over time. Uh, this happens, you react to, uh, uh, to uh, what, the, what the court uh, is saying, you reacted to what, what I was saying, you reacted to what the adversaries were saying. Uh, but the fact of the matter is he came in and asked for the whole process to be done uh, over uh, when the mail-in ballots had already been sent out, a number of thousands of mail-in ballots had already been received uh, with, the, uh, with uh, Mr. Monaghan having been given a, a party position. Um, and the, uh, some sample ballots as of October 3rd had already been sent to the uh, post office and others were prepared for mailing, at least based on the representation of the clerk in Puttering County. In any event, um, the focus of today's application is much narrower than what the court heard on October 3rd. Um, and the court is governed by uh, the court rule for Colin 49-2 uh, regarding motions for reconsideration. Um, and this was certainly filed within 20 days, provided by the rule given the date that the basis was provided. Um, and the, uh, the, the, Mr. Uh, Laverne has provided new information to the court. Uh, I think that uh, clearly the information was available. It was available from at least uh, June 13th, uh, whenever it was filed with the Supreme Court in, in the Rillo case. Um, even if it's not posted, um, you can make a request to the court for matters of public record. So uh, he could have gotten it. As, uh, I'm accepting the representation of Assistant Attorney General Donna Kelly uh, that the brief that Mr. Um, Laverne cited in his uh, in his own letter brief, that's the state's brief of June in the Rillo matter, uh, he cited it, he had it, uh, and accepting her representation that it specifically addressed, addressed uh, information that was in the Giles certification. So clearly, uh, uh, Mr. Laverne could have uh, cited the Giles certification to this court uh, to show that uh, uh, the various kinds of relief he wanted, including he wanted the redraw and he wanted the machine's program to be consistent with the redraw. He could have uh, shown that uh, the Giles certification last week, uh, and it, it certainly would have prompted uh, um, some additional questioning by the court back on October 3rd. But it's something that was available and he could have had. Uh, and, and his, his suggestion today that it wasn't an issue on October 3rd, uh, the court is rejected. Um, I was looking at the feasibility of any relief, any and all relief, uh, based upon the statutory violation. Um, Mr. Laverne, by his uh, knowledge of, uh, of uh, election law, surely knew that the mail-in ballots to servicemen under the federal law had to have been sent out uh, well in advance. Um, and yet he asked in the original uh, pleadings for the whole process to begin anew because of the problem with the, uh, with the drawing not being consistent with 5.1 uh, uh, as applied to special elections uh, uh, through uh, uh, the, the other provision of the election statutes. The, um, I can't recall if it was 1927-1. Uh, it might have been that. I don't have that right in front of me. 
rolling. But it, 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 it's something that clearly could have been provided to the court. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the thing that really motivates me more than anything else is, uh, is uh, what can be done uh, and, or what should be done uh, in terms of um, in terms of a, of a remedy for uh, what the court has found to be a clear statutory violation. Uh, so, so even though in cases like uh, Del Vecchio v. Penberger 388, New Jersey Super 179, Appellate Division 2006, uh, says you, the court should not grant reconsideration when the evidence was knowable, could have been found by the moving party prior to the time of the court's decision, um, the, uh, I'm not going to rest uh, my decision on, on that uh, rule. Um, Capital Finance Code for Delaware Valley versus Esther Body, 398 New Jersey Super 299, a public division case from 2008, um, is, uh, you know, is, is to the same, um, same effect. Um, but, but frankly, you know, at the time of, uh, I uh, decided the, the case last week, I, I really was, uh, was balancing uh, the various harms, uh, the harm to the voting process uh, by the violation of the statute that uh, Mr. Levert had, had, had uh, successfully urged the court to, to find, that there was a violation. Um, and I really considered at the, at the time requiring additional certifications because in my mind I thought, uh, I certainly considered uh, that if the machines could be programmed uh, appropriately, with a, if a redraw could be done and machines be, uh, be reprogrammed, uh, that, that clearly was something that I was considering as, uh, as possible uh, relief. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm looking at the notes now from the, uh, from the oral argument and from my decision, so I can't represent that I've listened again to the actual recording, uh, and I do not have a transcript. But I did say I could require more certifications, but I viewed that there wasn't time for that, that it was really important for me to give my decision on October 3rd and weigh what I had before me on that day uh, in light of the fact that the election was scheduled for um, October uh, 16th. Um, and so I looked at what was before me, um, and I don't believe, uh, maybe Mr. Levert will be able to, to, to prove this otherwise, but I don't recall saying, and my notes do not reflect, that I ever found that the uh, electronic machines could not be programmed in time for the October 16th election. I don't think I said that. Uh, because I don't believe I had that information before me. I don't think Ms. Kelly, maybe even, I don't recall that she said it, uh, because they were, the, the defendants were responding to the request that the whole thing be redone, and then this additional request that everything be done by paper ballots, which was submitted at the same time um, in opposite, in, in a, uh, as the supplemental group that came in, uh, in opposition to the relief the state seeking tomorrow regarding the rechecking of the machines, but also uh, in regard to this case. So they were responding to something that then got changed uh, in part by the court, by my question, because I wasn't going to change the mail-in ballots uh, and affect uh, federal law, so no basis for that. The application was far too late for that. Uh, the court was even concerned with the uh, uh, reprinting of uh, the sample ballots in particular. I mean, provisional ballots and emergency ballots are a much smaller, uh, much smaller universe, but we had over, over 140,000 mail-in ballots already sent out with the configuration based on the original form. Um, there had been, I think, over, uh, over 60,000 ballots had already been voted and returned to the county board of election. Um, so I was looking uh, not only with what could, practically speaking, be done, uh, but I was looking at what would the impact of, of, of that remedy be. And I, I was governed by a few things. And one of them, like I saw it at the time, and that was the Supreme Court decision in Mochari v. Caputo, 100 New Jersey 119. Um, and while that recognized the statutory right to draw a certain position is one that should be protected by the courts when it is impaired, um, in Moshari itself, 
uh, when the uh, when the court uh, case was brought after the redraw, they said if it's brought after the redraw, it's too late. Um, I didn't accept that as uh, as an absolute rule for this case uh, because I wanted to get a sense of what the impact would be of uh, of requiring uh, uh, a reprogram of the ballots. Uh, 13 days uh, before uh, before the election, um, and the uh, you know so uh, and, and when I heard that the sample ballots in Hunterdon had already been uh, sent uh, sent to the post office, um, and that there would then be an inconsistency between the sample ballots and the uh, and the machine ballot, uh, if I ordered the uh, machine to be changed. Uh, that, that there be a redraw and the machine to be changed, I got very concerned about the uh, impact on the integrity of the election itself. Uh, one of the county council raised the point that uh, if the voter uh, looked at the sample ballots, then the sample ballot could very easily uh, just pick the number of the columns. Certainly the way it was set up, uh, I think we had Burlington's uh, sample ballot and we had another county's sample ballot as well. And they were all, um, I guess two of them were lined up horizontally. Maybe it was a third on the show that was lined up vertically. But it is an election for one office, uh, the United States Senate. And so there was either a straight line horizontal or a straight line up and down. Um, and I was concerned that there could be voter confusion if the sample ballot and the official ballot uh, did not match. And Ms. Kelly today has pointed out that there is a, a, a statute that requires them to be the same. And so uh, when we have uh, the, uh, uh, the proven violation in terms of giving Mr. Lonigan the, the party uh, position, uh, on the ballot that we shouldn't have had under the law versus the uh, potential for voter confusion with the difference between the official ballot and the sample ballot, uh, my uh, balancing of that harm went in favor of the defendants and, and, the, and the right of the voters uh, to, uh, to express their preference uh, and therefore to minimize voter confusion if at all possible. Uh, I noted that the real, the real poll star for my decision uh, was the uh, was the, the right to vote of individuals uh, versus uh, the right to candidate to placement on the ballot. For example, for any uh, any particular county where uh, uh, Mr. Booker is in uh, is in place one, um, it's possible that we could have the exact same ballot after a redraw. I mean. If I was guided by other uh, cases that talk about the importance of preserving the, uh, the integrity of the voting process and minimizing uh, voter confusion. Um, and I was also concerned with the witness of the filing of, uh, of, the, uh, of the election case. Uh, Mr. It came, I mean, frankly, for the court's purposes, it was filed September 16th. I don't get copy of papers until the filing of um, until the money uh, has been filed. So the, the money was all straightened out September 16th. And then I said that I thought it was a reasonable uh, return date in terms of uh, getting all the counties served with what appeared, appeared to me to be a significant challenge and giving them the opportunity to be, uh, to be heard and to have a return date, thinking I thought that if uh, uh, October 3rd, uh, I thought that it might be time might be a good time for, uh, for there to be at least some of the relief sought um, to, uh, to be granted if a violation is shown. Um, but after I found that there was a violation of 1905-1 uh, because of its uh, 1927-1 that indicates that special elections are be governed in the same manner as general elections so that the 10% rule of 1905-1 uh, would be would apply to uh, special elections. Um, uh, I nonetheless uh, found that, the, uh, uh, that it was too late uh, for, uh, for the relief to, uh, uh, relief to be granted. Um, and I, I find that still uh, true today. Um, as I said, uh, it was not a basis of my ruling that they could not change the machines in time. It was the concern over, uh, over voter confusion and the fact that the, 
sample ballots and largely there are millions of sample ballots that we've prepared and it's going to be sent out. I even thought to myself, well, could, could there be, if we allowed the two different, if we allowed the official ballot to be different from the sample ballot, um, they could put up a sign at the, uh, at all the polling places, perhaps that would be one way to handle it to at least alert the voters who read the sign that they had to look at the, uh, at the ballot and not to be governed by the sample ballot. I thought of all these, uh, all these different things, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what could assure that, uh, that the election be, uh, be done in a way that uh, uh, met the law and still protected uh, the administration of the election. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, I determined that the, that the balance, as I mentioned, that the Times in October 3rd I determined it, uh, also today that the balance of harm uh, is uh, in, in favor of the defendants, meaning that injunctive relief uh, uh, to the plaintiff has to be denied. Uh, some of this, I think, that clearly comes with the timing of the filing of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the complaint. I don't want to quibble uh, with uh, uh, some of the uh, representations that Mr. Laverne made about his not knowing uh, when the draw was, uh, um, not sent out letters to the counties raising this issue, uh, but uh, once he sent it out, and uh, was again, I said that until the August 23rd, 22nd, or 23rd, when he sent those letters, the lawsuit wasn't filed until September 16th. He made certain representations to me about uh, right to no act and lack of cooperation from Burlington County. He uh, had the option to come to court uh, to, uh, to seek an emergent uh, over uh, release in light of the sensitivity of election contests. And, Frankly, uh, Mr. Laverne has been involved in numerous times uh, before in election contests where uh, the time sensitivity has also been, uh, been very important. It was the, uh, the case he brought in federal court, which uh, you mentioned it the last time, with Judge Wilson's decision at 900 F sub second 447. Um, and we know that failing to act promptly in election cases has been a basis for denying relief. That, uh, that's absolutely clear in Moshari. And in Moshari, um, there at least the court had the statistical information uh, about, the, uh, uh, about the drawings in Essex County and the drawings in Burlington County, uh, the probability that they would, uh, would uh, come up in, in the, uh, so many times with the, the local party and whoever the general party was was in, in charge of the county, I guess in the general party of the county clerk was involved with their, uh, their um, party and always gotten the first slot for something many, many years so that the probability was absolutely startling. Even in that case, uh, the court found that, uh, that it was too late. Uh, where there were, where, where at least we had the statistical proof. In this case, we had no statistical proof from Mr. Laverne. He cites Moshari and, uh, uh, and tells us what happened this year in Burlington and this year in Essex, but he didn't provide anything that, uh, any further statistical information, despite his uh, being involved uh, uh, in cases uh, uh, raising uh, you know, election matters, uh, uh, certainly, uh, more recently in that federal case and, and back, I think, in the, the Conservative Party, I think, versus, uh, versus Farmer. So Mr. Laverne knew the sensitivity of the timing of, of what he was doing, um, and um, he uh, uh, knew a lot about the election process uh, and the concerns of the court always uh, in the election cases to prevent uh, voter confusion which can impinge the public's constitutional right to vote. Judge Wilson was really clear on that uh, in, the case that uh, in the case that she uh, decided. Uh, and she noted that the New Jersey's important interest in avoiding ballot confusion and in ensuring the integrity of the election process. And that's at 900 F sub second at pages 465 to 466. Um, and the, again, the, the court was had to weigh what is the, what is the damage uh, uh, to the plaintiff versus the damage to the defendants. And, the, and, and it is, uh, perhaps technical violation is the wrong term, but, but Mr. Laverne and all the candidates that qualify by nomination for a petition are on the ballot. Uh, and in the ballots that I reviewed, they're on the same line as Mr. Lonigan and Mr. Uh, uh, 
poker. And although that was something that in the past was, I think the last time was another basis for Mr. Laverne saying we should have been in a separate column for, uh, you know, for voters uh, uh, nomination by petition, uh, that seems to be abandoned now. He's just looking for a redrawing that removes Mr. Lonnie from the second spot and allows all of the other candidates to have the right uh, to that uh, slot. Uh, again, it was a violation of the law, but when I look at that versus the confusion that can come from having a sample ballot that's different from the machine ballot, uh, and the uh, and the uh, the rush to try to reprogram machines, uh, it would have been a rush, I believe, even on October 3rd. Uh, could it have been done? Uh, as, I, as I said, I didn't count, I didn't rely on it's not being able to be done, and even today, um, the, could it conceivably be done? I think probably if I ordered it, it would be done. But I don't think it's worth taking that risk uh, to uh, to the uh, to the voting process of rushing something through. Particularly, I mentioned this the last time too. When I know that there have been issues uh, raised with the voting machines, Mr. Levert raised them himself when he argued for the need for a paper ballot uh, to then uh, argue that the ballot placement. Uh, and, and to, to order that the ballot placement that the redraw be done, reprogramming the machines in Middlesex now with 25% with of the machines having been sent to the polling places to get them back to reprogram them. If, if it conceivably could be done, um, I don't believe that it's appropriate to do it because of the risk to the, uh, to the election process itself and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the integrity uh, of the uh, of the uh, process. Um, so the, I also um, wanted to, to note that um, I think it was a case that was uh, cited. Um, by Ms. Kelly the last time, uh, McNeil versus Legislative Apportionment Commission, Commission of New Jersey, 176 New Jersey 484. Uh, the Supreme Court denied a stay there because the public interest is best served and harm to the voting public best avoided by ensuring certainty at this time in the 2003 electoral cycle and consequently by maintaining the status quo. Um, and that was done three months prior to the primary election at issue, and I believe that they uh, found a, a statutory violation in that case. Uh, but the, the public good trumped the statutory violation. Um, and, you know, that um, also, um, again, the, you know, the, in Mackenzie v. Corazon, 396 New Jersey Super 405, um, you know, delays in pursuing election litigation are something a court has to consider in determining the remedy. And it can preclude a court from fashioning uh, a remedy in an election case because of the sensitivity of the electoral uh, process. In McKenzie, there was a public question at, at, at issue uh, and a, a concern about the, uh, the interpretive statement of the week. And uh, that was what it was. Um, and uh, that, so the, the closeness to the election um, was, um, uh, it was farther away um, than, than we are now. It was even farther away than it was on the third. And the court nonetheless uh, find, uh, found that uh, uh, the, the plaintiff had contributed to the situation uh, and by the, by the way they had handled the litigation and that it was not appropriate to, uh, to grant the relief requested uh, because of the closeness to the uh, after the uh, election. So here, uh, now Mr. Laverne has modified his request for relief to seek just a redraw, I say just, a redraw in the ballot positions in all the counties. Uh, and um, uh, now he's saying just reprogram all the voting machines uh, for, uh, for every county. Um, and uh, I still have some, I uh, harbor some doubts as, uh, as to whether it all could be done uh, in light of, um, you know, the uh, Mr. Giles' uh, June certification in the Grillo matter, uh, assuming that all the legwork would be done 
uh, or you know, in terms of the configurations and so forth, would be done uh, so that they could move within 48 hours to reprogram the machine. So what Ms. Kelly describes as front end versus back end. I'm still concerned that the, uh, about the 48 hours, but that's not part of the, that's not going to be part of my ruling. Uh, the, uh, the, my ruling is that there be that the potential for harm to the voting process far outweighs the placement of the candidates uh, on the ballot, since all of them have a place on the ballot. Um, and um, the, um, uh, therefore, uh, the court will deny the, uh, the application for reconsideration and uh, go, uh, you know, rely both on the reasons I gave on October the 3rd and on the reasons uh, added to the record today. Uh, and the court will issue an order simply denying the motion for reconsideration. And um, I'm not going to uh, modify the order from the last time. And my order today will just deny reconsideration. The briefs can be forwarded to the uh, to the appellate division. They'll see what the uh, uh, what the arguments uh, were, uh, and they'll have my order uh, uh, to review if that's the course that the plaintiff elects to follow. So we'll make an effort, Emily, uh, uh, to uh, just immediately produce the order that we have for reconsideration. Thank you. Uh, uh, these are really Two questions. Number one, did you file a piece of papers besides the first law at two o'clock? Because I still know other people, they were even served. So I don't know the proof of service was filed. I received a proof of service uh, today. I, I mean, I was out yesterday, so I saw it today. I don't know when it came in. I had. I personally don't know of any other filing besides yours. Do you know, did any come in on it? Okay. And then my, my last question, since we're here, I'm in an unusual, unique position of having prevailed and having a case dismissed. And the declaratory judgment aspect, he says, yeah, he said, yes, that's what I would like. But in the back, he said, there's nothing we can do. That, I mean, the whole across the statute is, I'm talking about my final you know, all these cost of services, having these people run around the state to service them, um, award with that. How do I do that? Uh, because the order that we're doing to have this, because you're saying it's dismissed, this is, or do I say it as a procedural aspect? You can file a motion for a council. A motion for a council. That's true. Just a file. I'll go say. Right. You can say. You can file a motion for costs and the opt-in. Because there's one of the county circuit we're talking about, you know, $2,000 plus. So at least I can be reimbursed for, well, for five or five. You know, I, I, I have to see your application and, and give the, uh, but uh, the first one, you say yes, I just say yes, but you know what I'm saying. Because I want from the statute saying how to pay the final fee and the cost of service, just the whole cost. Well, you know what? Uh, there's no dispute, as far as I'm concerned, that we're prevailing on the law. And uh, I have to let you look at it, uh, any application for costs. It's I something you may, uh, I can tell you that in other areas, in Oprah areas, I have had. Um, the public entities agree without making to the court apply uh, for even council fees. It's not a competition, it's cost. I mean, it was a $250 fee, a $30, a $200 product, $50 plus, and $150 expeditious service to the county. My, my, only point is that maybe, my only point is that maybe you can work it out without filing an application. Um, perhaps you cannot. Sometimes that I'll is. I'll send a letter out of this Okay, well. Um, the, uh... They're not giving me an nickel without a Don't hit yourself. Well, I'll that's what I'm going to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you.